It's been decades since the last manned moon landing, Apollo 17, which happened in December 1972. Isn't it time we thought about going back to our dusty satellite and maybe even staying there? NASA has made a promise on this subject. They're preparing to send astronauts on the moon again, perhaps by 2025. This will all happen through a program called Artemis. It's also going to include the first woman ever to experience the lunar surface. Now you might ask, why haven't we done this already? One former NASA administrator said something interesting on the subject. It's not because of scientific or technological issues. Problem was that the potential projects took too long and were just too costly. You see, space travel, especially when it involves humans, isn't easy on the pockets. It's true that, in recent years, NASA had budgets of billions of dollars. Sure sounds like enough money, right? Well, not when you check out their to-do list. That's because they have to consider everything. From telescopes and giant rocket projects to missions also targeting the Sun, Jupiter, Mars, and beyond. When you look at it this way, NASA needs to be very good at budgeting to achieve all those goals. It's not just because of finances, though. The moon itself is quite problematic. It poses real dangers that cannot be taken lightly. For starters, its surface is filled with craters and boulders that aren't easy to land on. Then, there is the moon dust, or regolith, if you'd like to call it by its scientific name. It was created over many years by meteorite impacts. It's extremely harsh and sticks to everything. It can potentially damage spacesuits, vehicles, and systems quite quickly. Also, dealing with the lunar habitat isn't a walk in the park either. The moon has no protective atmosphere. What this means is that for 14 days at a time, the lunar surface is faced with harsh rays from the sun. That period is followed by another two weeks of total darkness. All these changes create extreme temperatures, which us humans are not really accustomed to. There are solutions, don't worry. NASA is working on dust and sun, resistant spacesuits and vehicles. They're even developing a system that might supply electricity during those lunar nights. What's even more interesting about this system is it could come in handy on Mars too once we get there. NASA also needs to draw in really smart people for its projects. Think about it. The average age of the people working for the mission control for Apollo 13 was just 26 years old. And these people had already been part of numerous missions by that time. Which means they'd had considerable experience from a very young age. But here's where other individuals can help too. In recent years, it wasn't just NASA who's been working tirelessly to revolutionize space travel. There are many successful people out there with enough resources to join in on these efforts. Some are developing new types of rockets that can land on the moon, too. In total, NASA landed 12 people on our satellite. It's definitely one of the most awesome moments in its history, if not the best. And those astronauts did amazing things up there. They brought back rocks, took snapshots, did science experiments, and even left flags behind. These were all important moments of the Apollo missions. But they weren't meant to create a safe place for humans on the moon. Scientists have had this idea of a lunar space station for a long time now. It's only logical. After all, it's just a three-day trip from Earth. It means we can, technically, afford to make little mistakes here and there, without messing up the whole project. Plus, we'd learn so much before venturing even further into space. A moon base could provide fuel for deep space missions. We could also build telescopes up there, and launch them way easier in space. It could also help us in another important project. Figure out how to make Mars habitable too. Not to mention, a lunar space station would help us learn more about the moon's origin. Who knows, it could even bring in some money because of all that fun, exciting lunar tourism. 
Either way, the Apollo Moon program took a lot of work. For starters, let's look at the sheer number of people involved. Around 400,000 from every corner of the states. Not everything was picture perfect, tough. There were two main unfortunate events. Firstly, a fire mishap at the launch pad of Apollo 1. Secondly, an oxygen tank decided to throw a tantrum on Apollo 13, causing severe issues mid-mission. An important part of the project was Saturn V. It is to this day the most powerful rocket flown successfully, being 36 stories high. Still finding it hard to picture? This rocket stood twice as tall as Niagara Falls. Thanks to Saturn V, NASA successfully completed 13 missions. This included chauffeuring 24 astronauts towards the moon, with half of them even having a little walk on its surface. The existing rockets and space shuttles can't go beyond low Earth orbit. In simpler terms, they can't reach the moon with all the gadgets astronauts need to thrive. Current space vehicles are just not capable of carrying that load, at least not since the Apollo missions happened. Regardless, we did make a lot of progress on Earth and are ready to send astronauts to our satellite pretty soon. Here's where the Artemis project comes in. It's a program overseen by NASA. And to make sure it all goes well, NASA previously launched Orion, a spacecraft with no crew on board to orbit the moon and return to Earth. Think of it as an automated test drive. Before we actually send people out there again, we need to make sure all the devices work properly. One day, Orion will be the vehicle that will take astronauts to the moon again. It features a launch abort system to keep astronauts safe in case something bad happens during launch. It also has a service module, which is the powerhouse that fuels and propels Orion and keeps astronauts alive with water, oxygen, power, and temperature control. All these future projects make one wonder, what will life on the moon be like anyway? We can only use our imagination for now. Some say we'll be living in homes straight out of a fairy tale, something like a cozy hobbit hole. Living underground on the moon might be a must. That's due to the scorching temperatures and the lack of oxygen. If you add meteorite threats and the non-stop radiation, it's no wonder we can't just walk on its surface. What about transportation? Big and small companies alike are trying to create the ideal moon ride. If current estimations are current, one type of moon taxi will take off as soon as 2024. Unlike our current rockets, these space taxis won't have to deal with the harsh conditions of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. It will be easier for them to make multiple round trips. To support our lunar living, we'll need to have a special area for space taxis to safely take off and land. Think of it as a landing pad on a firm, flat stretch of moon surface, protected by walls to shield against moon dust. Moving around on the moon surface will be made easier too. The next generation vehicles we're talking about will have their own controlled environment, which means you won't need a spacesuit while inside. Should feel like stepping out of your space ride for a bit. Then of course, you'll need to put on your spacesuit. All right, so we've got our homes and our rides sorted, but what about fuel? That's where the moon throws us a lifeline. The moon's lighter gravity means we don't need as much power to escape its pull. Plus, the moon has ice, and that's super handy. We might be able to convert this ice into rocket fuel. We'll need dedicated space gadgets to help gather this ice. One such tool is called Trident. It's like a drill, perfect for digging into the icy moon surface. Additional robotic helpers would then turn this ice into fuel and deliver it to a space gas station. If this works, rockets on their way to Mars could stop by for a quick fuel top-up before continuing their journey. People haven't set foot on the moon in several decades, but the situation is going to change soon. NASA's Artemis program is going to send a few missions to Earth's natural satellite. 
the first astronauts might step on the surface of the moon already in 2025, as part of Artemis 3, if the current schedule holds, that is. And then the next stage will start, and it will be an even more ambitious project than sending humans to the moon again. NASA wants to construct a base camp at our satellite's South Pole. Such an outpost will help the Artemis mission to break the previous record for the longest stay on the moon. So far, it's 74 hours, 59 minutes, and 38 seconds. Plus, such a camp can serve as a jumping-off point for missions setting off for deep space. According to NASA, at first, it's going to be a small camp, accommodating missions for a week or two. But soon, it'll grow in size and complexity and will be able to sustain crews for a couple of months at a time. There might also be an open-top rover similar to the one used in the Apollo missions and an RV. These options can provide mobility for astronauts while they live and work at the camp. With each new trip, the level of comfort of space explorers will increase. Specialists are now developing the technologies that will help people to work more easily on the moon, far away from home. There's also hope that building such a camp can help us prepare for an even more challenging step, human exploration of Mars. For the camp to function properly, it's very important to be able to find and extract resources from the satellite's rocks and dust. These resources can include water ice, metals, oxygen, and even some building materials. It'll help to lighten the load with supplies delivered to the moon. It can also potentially allow astronauts to remain there for longer periods of time. Now, why the lunar south pole? There are two very important reasons. First, building the base camp there will allow astronauts to have periods of continuous light from the sun. The moon is tilted in such a way that its south pole experiences up to two months of continuous light every year, when the sun is circling above the horizon all the time. And all this abundant sunlight can provide the camp with a lot of solar power. At the moment, NASA is trying to design a solar array that could stay more than 30 feet in the air. This way, it'll be able to make the most of the available sunlight. The second reason for choosing this location is deep craters that have been shrouded in darkness for billions of years, also because of the moon's peculiar tilt. Some of these craters haven't seen sunlight since the time of their formation, they're also known as permanently shadowed regions. And that's where scientists have found evidence of water ice. If we manage to access this frozen water and it turns out there's a lot of it there, it'll be hugely valuable for the inhabitants of the base camp. Plus, it might supply flights back to Earth or further on to Mars. We don't know yet whether there's a lot of water in that region or whether it's free of contaminants. But NASA is going to find out. One of the ways to do it is to use Viper. This mobile robot is likely to arrive at the Lunar South Pole in 2024. The Lunar Terrain Vehicle, or LTV for short, is scheduled to arrive on a mission in 2025. Astronauts will be able to operate it remotely, and it's likely to be able to avoid such hazards as rocks and craters on its own. Astronauts will then explore their surroundings either from the safety of the lander on earlier missions or, later on, from the base camp itself. Plus, NASA will use the LTV to conduct scientific or mission-related work even during periods of time when there will be no humans on the moon. The vehicle will play a crucial role in searching for water, ice, and other resources. But even though the LTV's remote-controlled capabilities are quite innovative, its design isn't going to change much. It'll look almost like the rovers that have come before it. If astronauts decide to drive the vehicle with its top open, they will have to put on their spacesuits, and that's not very comfortable. Donning such a suit can easily take hours. Plus, the duration of missions always depends on how much oxygen each astronaut's spacesuit has left. That's where NASA's RV-like concept, known as the Habitable Mobility Platform, comes into play. If this project succeeds, the RV will have a pressurized interior and life support systems, meaning passengers will be able to have a ride without their spacesuits on. This will definitely make life easier for astronauts. The final design of the vehicle isn't ready yet, but the main goal is to allow several people to live and work inside the vehicle for up to two weeks. Now let's have a look at what the future lunar cabin might look like. Its design hasn't been finalized either, but NASA is looking at modular and inflatable structures. 
it may help to create larger spaces for crews to live in. Plus, such kinds of structures are more compact and lightweight, so it will be easier to transport them to the moon. But there's one more intriguing possibility. How about a large-scale 3D printer that will use lunar soil and rock as its raw material? Such a machine might be able to produce bricks and other shapes, assembling dwellings from scratch. A prototype 3D printer is now building a test structure in Houston. Also, the first towns on the moon could probably be built in craters. They might be covered with protective materials, like plastic, reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants would have to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Bilbo Baggins would surely appreciate their aesthetics. On the moon, gravity is way weaker than on our home planet. And while it can make it easier for astronauts to walk and even run on the moon's surface, it's not so great in the long run. That's why inside the lunar base, there might be an artificial gravitational field. Without it, people would have problems with coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Plus, weight-bearing bones would lose 1 to 5% of mineral density per month. A geologist from the University of Notre Dame, who's been studying samples of lunar soil, says that rocks or dust may have a key role in protecting astronauts from radiation coming from solar flares and cosmic rays. On Earth, the planet's atmosphere and its magnetic field filter out most of this harmful radiation. But the Moon doesn't have the same shield because there's no atmosphere like on our planet there. The very weak one that our natural satellite has is made up of some unusual gases that haven't been found in the atmosphere of Earth, Mars, or Venus. That's why people working there will need extra protection. The experts say that up to six feet of lunar material might be needed to shield astronauts from the radiation. But besides building materials and water, there's another crucial resource on the Moon, and it's oxygen. NASA hopes to start extracting this gas from moon rocks. They also hope to find metals like aluminum. This could allow astronauts to live off the land, and the base would become much more self-sufficient than expected. It could turn into a resupply station for spaceships heading for Mars. But a colony on Mars would cost us trillions of dollars to construct and inhabit. It would take a long time for even one cargo ship to reach the Red Planet. Lunar camps are much easier to build and maintain. There will likely be direct spaceship routes connecting the satellite with Earth. And people will need just three days to travel between these two points. That's one of the reasons the colonies on the moon will be growing, developing, and changing non-stop. In 1969, when the first moon landing took place, not everybody believed it really happened. Some folks didn't trust what they saw on TV. They thought the footage looked cool, but all this might have simply been staged, like a scene on a movie set. Or they thought, how could we really have the technology to send humans all the way to the moon? And even years later, some people are still skeptical about it, even though there's thousands of pieces of evidence to prove that all the lunar landings actually occurred. Some of such non-credible theories even claim that the Apollo landing had happened somewhere in a desert in Arizona or Nevada. Some people thought the United States had pretended to go to the moon to win the space race against other countries. Others were sure the moon landing was a way to distract people from real problems. And in a way, it certainly did do that. Well, there are facts and there are fantasies. So let's take a closer look at this to set the record straight. First, about the photos. Doubters claim that since there was no Earth's light pollution or atmosphere on the moon, we should see thousands of stars in the picture. But this argument didn't take into consideration one crucial thing. The astronauts took the photos during the daytime on the moon. The sun was shining brightly, which made the moon's surface very bright. That's why the starlight was too faint to compete in the pictures. Another argument that doubters decided to raise was that the crosshairs in the photos sometimes appeared to be behind objects, which, in their opinion, suggested they had been painted on. But experiments made back on Earth showed that when an object was brightly lit, it could make the crosshairs appear fainter in the photo. And then, when you copy or scan the images, some of the details end up being lost. This creates the illusion that the crosshairs are behind the object. 
Yet another claim revolved around the American flag the astronauts had planted on the moon. In some photos, the flag seems to be fluttering in the wind. But hey, we all know there's no wind on the moon because there's no atmosphere. Actually, the flag appears to be fluttering because the horizontal rod at the top of the pole keeps it unfurled. The moon has a weak gravity not strong enough to straighten the flag out completely and create this slight waving effect. Some of the doubtful folks also point to a photo of a moon rock from the Apollo 16 mission that appeared to have the letter C written on it, like a prop in a movie. But after closer analysis of the original photo, they agreed that the C was probably just a piece of hair or thread that ended there during the copying process. Okay, here's one legit argument skeptics also like to bring up. The radiation in space might be too harsh to handle. There's this thing called the Van Allen radiation belts. These belts are like giant donuts around Earth, and they're filled not with creamy goodness, but with solar particles. Some people believe that astronauts couldn't have survived passing through these belts. Yes, being fried by radiation was indeed an important thing to be concerned about before the Apollo missions. The scientists and engineers that worked on the Apollo program wanted to make sure the astronauts would be safe. So they took several measures to protect the astronauts from radiation. For example, they used an aluminum shell to keep the spacecraft safe from radiation. Plus, they had to plan the entire trip from Earth to the Moon really carefully so that the astronauts spent as little time as possible in the Van Allen belts. And the average radiation these brave astronauts were exposed to was 0.46 rad, which stands for radiation-absorbed dose. This might sound like a lot at first. After all, it's around 10 times more than the radiation exposure of medical professionals who regularly work with X-ray and radiotherapy machines. But it's well within benign limits. NASA managed to keep the astronauts safe. We have so many records from the Apollo missions, including 8,400 photos, videos, scientific data, and audio recordings of conversations between the astronauts and mission control. They even brought us some souvenirs, about 840 pounds of moon rocks to study. But it doesn't stop there. NASA's spacecraft continues to orbit the moon. It takes incredibly detailed pictures of the lunar surface. It's captured some cool images of the Apollo landing sites and shown us abandoned modules and rovers the astronauts left behind. The resolution is so good that we can even see the footprints they left. Plus, during the Apollo 11 mission, the astronauts installed a special instrument on the moon called the Laser Ranging Retro Reflector. Yes, another technical mouthful from NASA. This device helps scientists measure distances by bouncing laser beams off the moon. Now that would be impossible to do if someone hadn't landed on the moon and deployed the thing. So, some hardened skeptics do believe we sent robots up there. They just don't think there were human astronauts really walking on the moon. They claim that the astronauts pretended to orbit the moon and walk on its surface using special camera tricks. There are also people who believe that humans did go to the moon, but they're also sure that some beings from other planets assisted them. They claim that the astronauts were hypnotized to remove their memories of meeting these unusual creatures from outer space. Well, human imagination has no limits. Neither does foolishness. But keep in mind that with a telescope that's good enough, you can see the Apollo landing sites yourself. And if you take a peek at the official photos, you can spot the remnants of the missions. It's important to know all these things, because NASA is planning to send humans back to the moon by 2030. This time, the goal is not just to visit, but to live and work on the moon's surface. NASA has recently launched its powerful Space Launch System rocket, carrying the Orion spacecraft toward the moon. During that trip, there were no crew members. But next time, a cadre of astronauts will make a trip around the moon. If all goes well, we could use the same spacecraft to land humans on the moon's surface, marking the first time since 1972. It's especially exciting because it might include the first female astronaut to set foot on the moon. Now, the plan is to land near the moon's south pole. Scientists believe that in that area, there might be water. Finding water is crucial because people up there could use it to create rocket fuel for future missions to Mars. Imagine using the moon as a refueling station to reach even farther into space. 
to support mining and scientific activities, we'd have to build permanent human settlements on the moon. So, picture yourself looking through some cool future telescope that catches everything in detail and seeing someone chilling there on the moon waving at you. But we're far from that yet. The moon still doesn't have many things we take for granted on our beautiful planet, such as water. You know, the real one, like oceans, rivers, lakes, rain, breathable air, and ecosystems to support agriculture. It's a barren and challenging environment. There's no atmosphere that could protect us from space radiation. On Earth, we use sunscreen, but on the moon, we'd undoubtedly have to sweat in those big spacesuits all the time. Also, the moon is vulnerable to solar storms. They can make a mess even here on Earth. Imagine what they can do on the moon. Plus, there are extreme changes in temperature there, together with extended periods of darkness followed by intense sunlight. Okay, the moon may sound exotic, but it would be pretty hard to survive there. We need to figure out what to do with oxygen, too. At first, we could transport air from our planet and pump it into sealed structures where people would live. That would be enough for a small population. But if more people started living there with time, we'd need some different methods to get air. For instance, the soil there has about 45% oxygen, which we could extract. I mean, why not? But before that, let's get ready for a day trip to the moon first. 